Hey everybody, thanks for coming to our uh, WealthQuest Learning Center for our topic on tax this evening. I see some familiar faces that have come before. We appreciate that. We're gonna be doing this monthly with rotating topics. So there's a card out on the table. You can look at the next few. We'll be sending emails out for, for kind of the next series. We just were doing a planning meeting for the first six months of next year. So we're excited and we're glad you're here. Thanks for coming. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. I think you all know where the bathroom is. You go out our door, it's in the middle of the building. Looks like everybody found some food and beverages. Please feel free to replenish yourselves if you like. The obligatory disclaimer will be printed up there for the people on Zoom, I need to read it. This presentation is being provided for informational purposes only. The ideas, opinions expressed on these slides and by Jason and Dan, who I'll introduce in just a minute do not constitute legal tax or investment advice or a recommendation of any particular investment or strategy. Any information prepared from third-party sources is believed to be reliable, though its accuracy is not guaranteed. Opinions expressed in this presentation reflect sub subjective judgments of the speakers based on conditions at the time of the creation of this presentation and are subject to change without notice. Anyone listening in person or at home should seek the input of their own financial tax or legal professionals before acting on any of the information provided. And of course, past performance is not indicative of future results. <laughs> All right, so I'm, Mike, I'm Michael Moore. I'm one of the advisors here. We've got uh, James, sorry, James, perfect timing. Just put a sandwich in his mouth. <laughs> uh, we've got Ryan, we've got Ryan uh, from our financial planning department. We've got uh, Michael Riney back there, another advisor. We have David, who you may or may not know, was promoted recently to president of WealthQuest. So I know, right? <laughs> and, and we've got Jason on the far right. So Jason's been a member of the WealthQuest tax team for the last six years and enjoys working directly with clients. And if he's on your tax team, I mean, we all love working with clients. And I think the tax people do especially, gives them a little break from their, their normal day-to-day -day stuff. He has degrees from Miami University and the University of Michigan. Won't hold that against you. Um, in addition to saving as much tax money as possible for clients, he's worked alongside the financial planning team to craft long-run tax reduction strategies and helps to implement them into individually tailored financial plans. Jason actively serves as a member of Seven Hills Church and would love to settle down and start a family in Cincinnati sometime soon. If you know anybody. <laughs> we take referrals of any kind. <laughs> Sorry, I, I read this and you know, whatever. All right, Dan Larson has been the director of tax planning at WealthQuest for 10 years and has enjoyed building a tax service model that integrates proactive, personalized tax planning with our clients' overall financial plans. Prior to joining WealthQuest, Dan was a tax manager at PricewaterhouseCoopers, specializing in tax services for expatriates traveling on international assignments with their employers. He's a member of the New City Presbyterian Church and serves on the board of Back to Back Ministries. Dan currently lives in his hometown of Madeira along with his four tax, no, not tax deductions, children. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Yeah. Well, let me, I'll uh, add my welcome uh, to Michael and just say that we're so glad to be together with you guys. Um, Jason and I love taxes, but uh, that's not really what gets us out of bed in the morning to come into work. We love working with you all. We love being in relationship with our clients. We're really thankful that you guys are here a chance to interact with one another and also interact with us. So please, if I haven't met you before, come up and say hi. I'd love to introduce myself and get to know you a little bit while we're here. So today, um, the, the title is Painless and Proactive Tax Planning. It's kind of the title because most people's interaction with tax is somewhat painful um, and mostly reactive. Uh, you're looking retrospective to the past year. So I don't know that we can make it painless, but hopefully less pain is the goal and try to be a little bit more proactive. Um, we have a broad audience here, so we're gonna move pretty quick over a lot of topics at kind of a high level. Um, not gonna go super deep into any one particular piece, but we would uh, love it if it becomes somewhat interactive here. So throughout the presentation, I'll tell you kind of where we're going. 
but then we'll have times to pause. If you guys have questions, uh, even now off the top of your head or as we go and we introduce certain items, feel free to text those in. Uh, Jason will keep an eye on those and uh, we can talk through those in the middle of the presentation. If we don't have time, we can't get to them all, we'll circle back with you at another point in time as well. Um, so where we're going, uh, agenda-wise, I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking through just some of kind of the year-end best practices, what should you be doing now to prepare for taxes. Then we'll move into, once we've looked at kind of year-end tax planning strategies, really in, under two headings. One is income recognition strategies, if we wanna pull income into the tax year. The other is income reduction strategies, if we wanna reduce income in the current year. And then we'll finish our time together with a little bit of uh, introduction to potential tax legislation, everybody's favorite topic, always in the news headlines, what is the new administration uh, gonna do? All right, so let me move first into this kind of best practices for year end. Um, so I know there's a lot on the slides here, but uh, first kind of tax planning 101 is you've gotta keep good records in order for anyone to be able to do projections and to figure out where are we uh, so that we can then plan for where we wanna go. So some of the things that we, these are just kind of some most common issues we run into with clients um, with record keeping. So first, economic impact payment number three, this is the COVID stimulus check. There were three rounds of this. This feels like a long time ago, but most folks got their second round payment in January. And then once the administration took over, uh, it felt a little bit like the current administration wanted to one up the previous administration, say we're gonna do another check. And so in March, April timeframe, there was another check about $1,400 per person. Varied, phased out based on income levels, so not everyone got it. This is one of those tax items that you need to provide to your tax preparer, but you are not going to get a tax statement in January that talks about it. So you may have gotten a letter uh, from the White House, you may not have. Um, best place to check is really bank records going back into those months uh, to confirm what happened there. Um, another thing that they changed this year, advanced child tax credit. This is for uh, folks who have kids kind of age 17 and under. There's a potential tax credit on their tax return and the government wanted to uh, proactively give you money uh, kind of throughout the year. So starting in July of this year, people started getting checks from the government. It's a prepayment of a tax credit that they may be eligible for on their tax return uh, in the spring. So um, if you or your kids have uh, dependents those ages, that's another one of these items. They've got to keep track of it. They have to tell their tax payer about it. They're not going to get a statement that tells them what they received. Um, that's another kind of unique one. Estimated tax payments, probably the main thing that we get tax notices from the tax authorities on. We prepare a return and the government says those tax payments you said your clients made don't match up with what we have in our system for what they actually made. It's a really easy thing to lose track of. Did I make my third quarter payment? Did I pay my second quarter twice? Uh, we have that question all the time. Again, no statements that you get that will show you what to do with that. So this one's really helpful for us when we have clients that have good records to keep track of those estimated tax payments. Um, I will say I'm gonna skip down to the very bottom here where to find this information. That last bullet point, this IRS secure access online, this is relatively new for the IRS. They're rolling out a system. The IRS is the most archaic organization, <laughs> unsurprising to, to no one. Uh, they are finally starting to do more things electronically. And so now you can go out and essentially verify your identification and create an account online. That allows you then to get access to tax transcripts. Tax transcripts are, are not a new thing. But in the past, you would have to request these. The IRS would mail them to you three or four weeks later uh, through snail mail. Now you can request it online and get it immediately, a report sent to you. And the tax return transcript will show economic impact payments. It will show estimated tax payments you've made. It will show the advanced child tax credit. So these items that we think we know we may, but we're not sure, we can double check what does the IRS have in its system for me using that IRS secure access. Uh, so, it's a really um, surprisingly easy tool to use. It takes maybe 15 minutes to set it up. But um, if it was me, I would be setting this up and adding this to kind of every year when I pull my tax details together, I'm gonna go out to the system. I'm just gonna pull my transcript and put it in with all my other tax documents. I'll give that to my accountant and that verifies it. 
Okay. Um, another one, big one, charitable giving. I'm switching back up to the top here. Charitable giving. Uh, most places, you know, you get the receipt from the organization. The big one that we always get is non-cash charitable gifts. You go to Goodwill and they give you a flyer that has the date on it and that's it. Not very helpful <laughs> for us. We get a lot of those from clients that I say, well, just, you know, use the maximum. Uh, <laughs> there is no maximum. We need you to tell us what that is. So keeping track of your charitable receipts, really important. Um, most organizations, organizations required to send your receipt if it's more than $250 in donation that you made to them. But if you send less than that, the organization isn't required to give you a receipt and you may not get one, you should still be able to deduct it. Same with cash donations. You're probably not getting receipts if you put 20 or $50 into an offering plate because the church doesn't know who that came from. But you can keep track of that. You can still deduct it even if you don't have a receipt for that. So that's important to remember. Um, these last two, dependent care expenses, health care expenses, uh, these are potential deductions, credits on the tax return. Um, important to know, uh, for dependent care expenses, um, you do need some additional information about who provided the care to my dependents. So kids 14 and under, if they're in some type of, they have an um, after-school program or some type of daycare program, you need more than just the amount spent. We need to know the tax ID number for that in order to take the credit on the tax return. Healthcare expenses are up there because um, folks uh, may have multiple ways that they pay their healthcare expenses. Um, you've got HSA accounts and FSA accounts. We'll talk some about those. Um, may pay some out of pocket. So um, it's really helpful if you kind of not just show, here's everything we paid, but you know which funds were used for this. Because some of those may be deductible, but if those were paid with FSA or HSA funds, no tax deduction for those uh, available. Okay, so that's kind of the record keeping piece. I'll move um, next into what are we using this all for? Um, obviously, to prepare the tax return, we need all this information. But um, our recommendation is that we do really a year end tax projection. Once we get past year end, uh, we're limited in some of the planning that we can do. Um, we still need accurate information to prepare the tax return. but we've maybe lost certain opportunities uh, to do tax planning. So we always recommend, particularly in years where there might be significant changes, changes in family dynamics, changes in jobs, changing in income or deduction, let's take some time at the end of the year to do a quick rough estimate. We don't need to give 100% accurate details, but quick rough estimate to figure out where are we at tax-wise. Uh, so we're pulling together all that information, giving it to your tax preparer to say, can you just run a uh, projection for me? Let me know where we, how do we look this year for taxes. That's valuable really for a couple of reasons. First, our, our goal is always to minimize surprises with the tax return. Right? Uh, we love calling clients, hate calling them with, hey, you owe a bunch of money that you didn't expect you were going to owe. Uh, we want to minimize that. Most folks, if we can explain why you owe it and give them some time ahead of that bill to plan for it, it's a it's, you know, much easier conversation to have. Um, the other piece that we're always trying to, in, in addition to just getting an accurate picture, what are we going to owe? We also are trying to figure out, are we okay from an estimated tax standpoint, or do we need to adjust what we're paying in estimates? Right. So um, whole goal with estimated tax payments is to minimize underpayment penalties. The IRS will penalize you even if you pay your full tax bill by the due date, but you waited all the way until the end of the year to pay it. They say, well, you had three quarters where you were sitting on extra cash that you should have been given to us. We're going to penalize you for that. So the estimated tax payments, that's our, our goal. We're, our goal is not necessarily to have you break even through estimated tax payments. Uh, our goal is to make sure that you avoid underpayment penalties. So we want to pay in the minimum amount we need to in order to mitigate those underpayment penalties. And that's really a function of looking at what did you owe last year? What do we expect you owe this year? And the IRS has some safe harbors to say, let's take the lower of those two numbers and pay that in. So I can have a conversation with a client that says, this is what you need to pay for underpayment penalties. This is what you still are going to have to pay. And then we have some discussion about when should we pay that extra. Um, 
The other thing that can come out from that exercise is do we need to adjust uh, what we're paying in estimates, not just now, but going forward? Do we need to look at if we're uh, having withholdings through payroll? Should we adjust that to make sure this doesn't recur every year or is this kind of a one-time thing? And then finally, once we look at that and we figure out here's, here's what we expect you're gonna owe, here's what we need to do from an estimated tax standpoint, the, the natural next step is what should we do to plan around that? Um, we've got a picture of what we think your income tax return is gonna look like. At this point in the year, we've got 11 months of data. So now with the last month of the year, what should we do, um, if anything, from a tax planning standpoint? And that's where we'll move into the kind of the next two sections where part of that is if, if I've got a year where I have a low tax rate currently, I might actually want to pull income onto my tax return. How do we do that? Why would we do that? Um, if I've got a year where my income tax rate is high, uh, I want to try and find as many ways as possible to reduce that tax liability. So to frame that discussion, uh, tax planning 101, always defer taxes as long as possible. That's typically what we're trying to do. Uh, we want to minimize our tax bill, and whenever we can pay that, that same tax liability in the future, we're going to do that. That's the whole idea behind your retirement savings. Like, we're going to pay tax on these dollars, but I'd much rather pay it way in the future than right now. So that's the, the general framework that we think through as tax preparers, but that does get flipped on its head if we expect tax return uh, in the future is going to have a much higher tax rate. Typically, I want to defer as long as possible. But if I look ahead and I say, based on my circumstances, this tax year is really low or it's lower than what I expect my future tax rate to be, I want to take advantage of the low tax rate now. It's counterintuitive. I don't want to pay any more tax than I have to. But if that tax bill is coming anyway and it's going to be larger in the future, I might want to pay it now. So Jason's going to come up for a few minutes and share on that aspect if we find that we've got room to pull income on, what are the types of things that we're looking at to do? Okay. Can everyone hear me? Great. Thank you, Dan, for that really good overview and just kind of high level what to expect from us today. Um, as Dan said, the, there are different components what we're talking about today. And the first is looking at um, if we have a scenario where we have a low tax year, and we want to voluntarily recognize income because we feel like that would be, in the long run, a minimization strategy by, by smoothing out the tax pain over the years. Um, here are some examples of how we can um, recognize income now. Um, so the first would be um, capital gain harvesting. And really these three bullets here, to start off the question is, what kind of assets do you have? What, what containers are you holding them in? So for the capital gains, that would apply to a taxable brokerage account. The Roth conversions, that would apply if you had a tax deferred individual retirement account. And then the employer stock options, that's if you're um, actively working and your employer gives you options to purchase some of their stock. Um, so again, the starting point is what do you have? And then what, what can you work with? So the first, first item is um, looking at capital gains. So anytime you have a security, stock or a bond, um, if you sell it for more than you purchased it, that results in a gain. Um, and if any of you have had the wonderful exercise of moving, moving houses, moving apartments, you know, cramming everything in that U-Haul, there's, there's different sizes and pieces. There's furniture, there's tables, there's beds, they're all a little different. So if we take a, uh, just a brief glimpse here, where you'll notice that the long-term gain rates, so if you hold security for more than a year and you sell it at a gain, those tax rates are preferred. They're a little less than the ordinary income, ordinary being wages, interest income, profits from business. So just like that scenario of how do I fit everything in my U-Haul, if the pieces are different sizes, the tax rates are a little different, then we're looking at how do we fit everything in in a way that results in lowest tax for you. Um, so for example, let's say you're in the 24% marginal rate 
that's where your wages are taxed at. Then when you're selling your stock that's held over a year, that would be taxed at the 15% rate, just for an example. Um, it's going back here. Um, another thing to consider is you might have an outside brokerage account. Let's say you have a Robin Hood account that has a few bucks here and there, and you have a couple sales, just things you find interesting. Um, that matters as well. So as, as your tax advisor, we definitely want to know what, what summary you have in that account, just so we can have an accurate view of, hey, if you're $10,000 or $20,000 away from the next marginal bracket, we want to know how much room you have left to fit in. Um, and this last point here is that if you uh, purchase an individual security, let, let's say, for example, you purchased um, Procter & Gamble 20 years ago when it's at $40 a share, and then you purchase it a couple years ago when it's at $100 a share. Well, let's say it's worth $140 now. Do you want to realize $40 of gain or do you want to realize $100 of gain? Um, so keeping, keeping track of what you purchase it for, that, that cost basis, that can impact, um, you can select what you sell it for. So how much room do you have? That's, that's just getting back to, you know, keeping good records and being organized. Yeah, and the, the um, I know some of you all have experienced this as well. Everyone thinks capital gains 15%. Capital gains have their own brackets, same as others that that go up, zero, 15%, 20%. And so that's what this is illustrating is the same idea behind ordinary income we wanna stay below certain brackets. Capital gains have that same exercise going concurrently on your tax return. We're gonna manage our ordinary tax rate and our, our capital gain rate. And if we've got room at 0%, it's a no brainer, we're doing it. Um, if we've got room at 15%, maybe, maybe not. Um, those are the types of things. Um, and the share specific piece is something that folks don't always know that you can do. If you just sell stock, the broker is going to take your oldest stock and that's the one they're selling. You say, I want to sell 100 shares, they're selling the oldest 100. That typically has your most appreciation there. So we may have for some reason say, we want to recognize $10,000 of gain. But um, I also want to try and sell as much of this stock as possible. So I actually want uh, to keep my lowest basis stock. Um, and sell some of my more recent stock so that I get more of the, that position out, if this makes sense. So I may wanna do other things with my lowest basis stock. And then I may wanna take a slice of the stock that I bought more recently and sell that. The gains will be much lower. I'll be able to sell higher volume of those shares and recognize a lower capital gain there. And that way I'm getting out of a position more quickly without recognizing tons and tons of gain because I'm selling the shares I bought but you do have to tell the broker at the time of selling, these are the shares I want you to sell. You can't do it after the fact. And you're not gonna get any statements that tell you that's what they did. You have to keep record that you told them to do that, they confirmed they did it. So uh, it's kind of a, a little known strategy with capital gains that uh, a lot of folks don't know about. Right, yeah, exactly. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You are correct. You are very correct. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, so FIFO, right. Well, FIFO is gonna be the default that, that happens if you don't say anything. The share specific is really that one, one time that you sell, what, what do you want them to sell? You're not locked into that for the future shares after that as well. Um, that also means they're not gonna do it automatically next time. They're not gonna come and ask you, are you sure you wanna do FIFO? They, the, the broker will sell first in, first out. That's what they're instructed to do by the IRS uh, unless, unless we elect otherwise. I don't know, does that get to your point, James? Or were you thinking of something else? Yeah. 
Yeah, so two, two different things there. One is just the, the shares that we're selling, are they using the oldest shares or are they using the shares we, we tell them to, to? Default, they're gonna use the oldest share. Just that one time, it's gonna be the shares that you, you tell them to do. The other question is, um, can we account for basis differently? Some of that depends on with, whether these are mutual funds versus funds in a, a drip account. Probably gets a little bit more complicated, but you do, in, in some cases, you are locked into, if I'm gonna change how basis is calculated for um, fund, a, a kind of a conglomerate of shares that I have, you might be locked into that going forward. Because the IRS isn't gonna say, well, for this group, you used that basis because it was favorable, and then for that group, you used a different way to calculate basis because it was favorable. So there's some, some nuances there, but two slightly different things. One's basis, one's which shares are we selling. So, Paul, did you have a question? Oh, yeah, I was curious. Yeah. Do you have anything across the board that you can think of that can be based Yeah, so uh, this is a great, a great question we have a lot with clients because um, we are uh, at WealthQuest, Tax Repairs, also investment advisors, and we um, need to talk to one another. There might be good reasons to do things from a tax perspective, but not necessarily investment driven and vice versa, investment driven, tax driven. My message is always we are first and primarily investment advisors. And if there's a compelling reason to uh, harvest gains or to sell a position for the overall health of your portfolio, we're gonna do that. And taxes to a certain degree uh, are just kind of a consequence that we're gonna live with. We'll manage that consequence as best we can, but we are not a, a place that believes philosophically that this uh, is the right investment decision, but it's gonna generate um, you know, 15% tax liability, so we're not gonna do it. If it's the right investment, right decision investment um, wise, that's what we're gonna do. Um, we do have some clients who are more tax sensitive or the, those decisions um, have much larger dollar uh, amounts and so we have some flags in our system internally to say before you do this this is what the investment team recommends but we need to have a discussion with the client to make sure they're comfortable with it and see if they want to do anything to manage that so generally speaking investment decision is going to drive we'll manage the taxes based on that but for very significant amounts we'll have conversations with clients ahead of time that's a great thought are there any other questions Yes. <laughs> There's no assurance. Yeah. yeah. So it's there because that was uh, President Trump's um, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act put tax brackets that sunset. It's one of the ways that they can get things through Congress is they say, well, we wanna make this change, but we won't make it permanent. We'll put it in for a certain number of years. But even when it's in for those years, it can always be changed right. before that expiration. There's nothing that says these can't change before 2020. But yeah, even right. if Congress does nothing, they will change it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, there is that. Well, well, great, we'll have more time for questions as we go along. We'll keep moving for now. So the second uh, strategy for recognizing income in the current year would be Roth conversions. So if you have a traditional IRA, um, the idea here is if you have a financial plan, we can map out when will you take Social Security, what will be your required minimum distributions, are you expecting an inheritance, all of these things factor into what would be your tax rates in 20 or 30 years into the future. So if we're looking out into the future and we can predict that on our current tax code, you'll be in the 24% bracket, but say this year you're in the 12%, then there's a pretty good reason to voluntarily convert a portion of that tax deferred IRA now, not all that, just, just a sliver. So that way is, it becomes the tax-free Roth um, when you are later in that much higher tax bracket. That's, that's the basic idea of what we're doing here. And the tax team typically starts emailing and calling clients right about now, now until mid-December. So this is very a common item that, that we'll do in our practice. Um, to kind of say a little bit more, the pros about being in 
a Roth are that first, your earnings will grow tax free. Um, and then second, there's no required minimum distributions. So it's more, um, it's easier, less hassle. Um, a couple cons to be aware of. One, if you're um, 65 or over and you're on Medicare and Medicare B premiums are also uh, in a progressive scale, meaning that if your income is higher, you're gonna pay a little more for your premiums. So that's something that the tax team is aware of when we're increasing your income in the current years, it's gonna affect how much you pay in Medicare premiums two years from now, because there's, there's a two year lag for that, that correlation. Um, and the last thing is social security benefits. The, that's kind of a strange animal in tax land in that it's tax relative to your other income. So it, 0% of social security could be subject to taxation or up to 85%. And that, that band is pretty narrow. So it could go very quickly from zero to 85. So even if you could stay within a certain tax bracket for a conversion, you still might not wanna do it if social security goes from zero to 85. Oh, Dan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think that's, uh, those are great points. Those last two there are not unique to Roth conversion. That, that's true of any income you're pulling onto your tax return, whether it's capital gain harvesting, additional ordinary income, um, but it is a way where you can't just look at the tax costs of that one item you're pulling. What are the ripple effects on my Medicare premiums, on my Social Security benefits, if any? And maybe the tax rate cost is, is right, but when I factor in those other costs, it's not great. Um, this is the epitome of what I was introducing before, where we've got money that's going to be taxed in the future um, that we're pulling forward and taxing now because we want to have less taxes in the future. So. It is, um, Roths are an incredible investment vehicle, super, super valuable. IRAs are also really good investment vehicles. So it's not as if that one's bad and this one's good. One is good and one is um, better in some, in some ways. And so there is absolutely nothing wrong with doing the analysis and saying, no, I'm just gonna leave it in the IRA. IRA is still a tax deferred, tax sheltered account, still has really nice features to it, but there are also ways to kind of possibly get even more tax efficient with the, that money by getting it over into a Roth if the hurdle is, is right. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it, I think ever since it started and came out, people thought, well, that's not going to last. Uh, I, yeah. I don't, I think it would be a very challenging thing to start making it taxable. I think what's more likely is that they will limit your ability to continue funding it, limit your ability to get money into it, maybe do away with it going forward and saying, well, we just can't have that. Um, but in some ways, the IRS likes Roth IRAs and Roth conversions, right? They are taking money that they're not getting that tax for 10, 20 years. And they're encouraging people, we'll take that money now. And they're, they're so they, um, they're in kind of a hard place. <laughs> they want the short-term benefit, the long-term benefit. I think it's, it's likely that they'll continue to look at this as we can't make these too easy and too attractive for people to accumulate a ton in these. But I really don't, I would be very, very surprised if they figured out a way to start saying, hey, everybody that we told for 20 years, this is going to be tax free. All of a sudden, it's going to be tax. Yeah, I mean, there there are yeah. plenty of people who, yeah, think that 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 is a possibility, um, but there hasn't been any proposed legislation on that. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, there many things are possible, but it's likely that other maneuvers will be made before. That's that's my personal opinion. It could be wrong, but I, I think there are other other ways that the government can get money rather than going right after Roth. Yeah, so Jason, we're a little behind here. We may, I don't know, unless you really want to talk stock options. <laughs> um, super briefly, if you are um, if you are in that active working phase and your employer offers options, there's a couple different types, there's not qualified incentives, um, and then there's restricted stock. So if you have restricted stock, please talk to your tax advisor. 
there are different elections that can be made when to recognize the game on that or the, the basis. Um, so that's, that's really it. If you have these, we can guide you further along that process. So any, any other questions so far? Okay. Sure. Yeah, so the first question is about short term capital gains. So those are, they do not have the preferred rate. Those are taxed at ordinary rates, it's like wage income. Um, offshore question, I'm not entirely sure how to answer that. Yeah, it, uh, it might be something that we circle back to. It's, it's a little specific. Um, and there are a lot of nuances to uh, investments outside the US. Yeah, so, but the short term capital gains, Jason's right. The only thing to be aware of some people have those stocks that just pop in the short term and they're really nervous about them. They want to offload them, but the tax hit is going to be really large. Um, the slide talked a little bit about how capital gains are netted together. So, if you do have, uh, or maybe I have a slide coming up, we'll talk about losses that could be used to offset gains, and that might apply to that question. Has yeah. to go through a brokerage account. It can't be a direct transfer. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the main, so they can't convert after they take a distribution. So the conversion that we're talking about is the money's still in an IRA and we're, we're transferring it over. We can't take the money out first. Um, there could be ways to still contribute to a Roth IRA um, with after tax dollars um, in years where you have an RMD, but you do have to have earnings uh, each year to contribute to a Roth IRA. So no way to, to somehow take your RMD itself and kind of convert it over to uh, the Roth. If you are after age 72 and you've got IRA funds, you'll have to take an RMD. And then if you would like to do a conversion on top of that, you can, um, but both the RMD and the conversion are gonna be taxed. All right, great. Well, I'll hand it back to Dan and I'll finish it off. Yeah, thanks, Jason. So it's a lot more fun to talk about reduction uh, strategies than recognition strategies. So that's why I gave it to Jake. That's right. Uh, so this is traditional tax planning. This is what we want to do. We want to lower our tax bill as much as possible, and we want to uh, push taxes off as far as possible if we can. This there are many many ways to do this. Um, a lot of this will depend on circumstances, but these are kind of four pretty common ones that we run into with a lot of clients. So employer payroll deductions, capital loss harvesting, charitable giving, and then gifting appreciated stock. So uh, employer deductions, I'll go through this quickly. Obviously, the biggest one here is if you're working and you have access to a retirement plan, um, maximizing that's typically one of your largest and best tax deductions. It's money that you get to keep. It goes into a, a tax sheltered account. So it's gonna grow tax deferred, uh, which helps fuel growth. And you get a current year tax deduction for it. A current year tax deduction typically reduces federal and state taxes as well. So there are contribution limits there, um, but that's always kind of the first place we go if someone's saying, what can I do to lower my tax bills? Are you maximizing your contribution to your retirement plan? And if you're self-employed, there's a, a variety of, of uh, retirement plans that you can contribute to. It's not uncommon for us at all to have folks who are retired and working self-employed with kind of a, a consulting job, and they don't really need that for living expenses. They have other assets that they can live off of, um, but they enjoy the work, and there's ways to defer, in some cases, 100% of that income that they're making, put it into savings, and pay no tax on it in the current year. Um, so if you are consulting, have your own business, sole proprietor. Um, part of that tax plan that goes around that is, can I, should I be contributing to a, kind of an employer retirement plan, the equivalent of a 401k, but I'm the employer and the employee in that case. Um, we're also looking at any other uh, benefits the company may offer. Uh, if you've got living expenses that you pay for out of pocket, but 
the company has a benefit plan where you can funnel those through as a pre-tax deduction. I'm still paying the same amount um, for healthcare expenses or for childcare expenses, but I'm getting a pre-tax deduction for it um, before I pay it. Uh, I'm getting to deduct the cost of that. The flex spend account and health savings account, two really common ones uh, that we have for health insurance, medical, dental. Um, people get these confused all the time. FSA is an account that has a smaller maximum amount you can contribute to, about $27.50 a year. You have to use it or you lose it. So you don't put too much in. The HSA is different, has higher maximums. You contribute $7,200 in the year if you have family coverage. And that amount can carry over and can grow. And as long as it's used for, uh, you get a tax deduction when you put it in, it's used for medical expenses in the future, no tax on, uh, on that either. Uh, you can actually have both an FSA and an HSA. It's not terribly common, but you can use both. The other thing with the health savings account um, that we run into, so uh, husband and wife can both have an HSA. Uh, if it's family coverage, you can put in $7,200 as a family. You can split that however you want through the husband and wife. Um, but uh, if you're over age 55, you can put in an additional $1,000. And that would apply to both the husband and the wife. So that 7,200 maximum becomes 9,200 that you can put into an HSA, as long as one of you puts in at least 1,000 into yours and then the remainder goes in the other. The HSA typically can't be, it, well, it can't be used, not typically, it can't be used after age 65. Once you go on Medicare, you can no longer contribute to an HSA. But if you're under that age, um, funneling money in here for current health expenses is, is great and kind of a no-brainer. Another way that these can be used is to say, I'm gonna put them in this account, this health savings account, and I'm gonna invest that account, and I'm gonna pay my current medical expenses just out of pocket, and I'll let that HSA grow, and I'll use it in my retirement years. You can use these funds in your 70s and your 80s to pay for healthcare costs. So for folks who start building these when they're in their you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, they could have, you know, seven, eight thousand dollars a year that goes into an account is invested and grows for decades and then is used in the future for their health care expenses in retirement years um, and pay no tax on the growth. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the health savings account has to, uh, you're only eligible to do it if you have a high, high deductible health plan. Um, most employers that do a high deductible health plan will say, here we have an HSA with it, but they're actually two completely separate things. Um, you could have a high deductible health plan and just open an HSA on your own. If your employer says we use you know, Fifth Third for an HSA, but you don't like Fifth Third, you can go open an HSA on your own um, and manage that uh, by yourself there. Um, and some, like any other banks, some HSA custodians are easier to work with than others. Some will allow you uh, to invest uh, in ways that you know, are a little bit easier, don't have as many fees. Others will say these are more like cash accounts and you can't do as much. So it, you're not limited. If your employer says, here's our HSA, it's with Fifth Third, you're not limited to stay with that. You can open it somewhere else. And we have clients who've done that because they want to invest and we you know, have an online bank that will uh, say, do your HSA through this online bank and invest there rather than using the one that your employer, the bank that your employer kind of invests. All right, so uh, other cafeteria plans, benefits, that's just kind of asking employers, you know, can I, is there a way for, uh, do you have any other insurance plans, um, you know, parking, typically pretty small benefits, but things I'm paying anyway that I could get a pre-tax deduction for through my employer. Um, all right, so loss harvesting, this is where we talked a little bit about capital gains um, earlier, harvesting capital gains. We can do the opposite with capital losses. A uh, big thing to know in capital losses, if I sell uh, an asset, an investment asset for less than my cost basis, I've got a loss. That loss is recognized in the year that I sell it. Um, and it's netted together with any other gains I've recognized that year. And then if I've got an overall loss, that loss is limited to $3,000 in the current year and the excess carries forward 
to offset future gains or to take that you know, $3,000 loss every year if I have that. So loss harvesting is, is one of those great vehicles that we say, well, if we've gotten accounts that we've recognized capital gains in because we're rebalancing the portfolio or I've got that stock that I, has just done really well and I'm uncomfortable, I want to get rid of it, but I hate to pay the gains on it. Are there other positions that we've got at losses that we can offset with that? Um, these are a little bit hard to come by in our accounts these days. The stock market's done really well over the last several years, so we don't have a whole lot of losses. But when the market dips, certainly it's something that we proactively try to take advantage of for our clients. If you've got outside accounts that we don't manage, um, we love to get a view into what is going on in that account. Not just what have you sold during the year, but what are the unrealized gains and losses? Are there positions in there that we could, you know, harvest losses there to offset gains we've recognized over the years. Um, so that's uh, capital loss. The last piece there, wash sales, something to, be, to consider. The wash sale rules, don't, the, the IRS doesn't like you to take a position that has, has taken a loss. So I'm gonna sell that position, recognize the loss, and just buy back the same position at that lower price and hold on to it. So they have a 30-day window that says, if you sell a position, and you recognize a loss, you can't buy back that exact same position for at least 30 days. Um, so the strategy there for us is we still have positions that we say, well, in the long run, we kind of like this position, but it's taken a hit recently. And we think over the long run, it's still great, but I'd like to lock in that loss. We'll sell it and harvest that loss. And then we'll buy something that's roughly equivalent to it and hold on to that for at least 30 days. And then after 30 days, after 60 days, we can evaluate. Do we wanna stay in this new thing as roughly equivalent, or do we wanna sell that and buy back the original investment? At that point, we're past the wash sale rule. But just something to be careful of, especially if you do some of your own trading, sometimes people run afoul of this and just say, oh, this, you know, whatever this stock was, it's got a lot of volatility and I'm gonna play with that volatility to my benefit. Um, and I'm gonna take advantage of the losses, and, but then, it's gonna go right back up and I'll get a bunch of upside on it. Just have to watch out for that wash sale rule. All right, um, next, this is a big one, charitable giving. Uh, we talk about clients all the time. It's probably the tax planning tool you have maybe the most control and flexibility over, um, the lever that you pull here. Um, main thing to keep in mind with charitable giving as this works. It's a charitable giving, generally speaking, a federal tax deduction. And it goes into the, uh, when we prepare a tax return, we have to look at the standard deduction and the itemized deduction, right? And say, you get to take the greater of these two items. Standard deduction for 2021 is going up to, for married couple, 25,100. So you get that regardless of what your itemized deductions are. And you're not going to itemize your deductions unless you get over that hurdle. So your itemized deduction bucket includes mortgage interest if you have any, state and local income taxes, and charity. There used to be a lot more in it, but that's really the, the three that you've got now. So mortgage interest kind of is what it is. Your state and local taxes currently are limited to $10,000 a year. That's your income taxes and your property taxes you paid. Can't deduct more than $10,000. And then you've got charity. So you can imagine if the hurdle is $25,100, say my home is paid off, I take $10,000 deduction for taxes, that means I need at least $15,000 of charitable giving before I get any benefit on my tax return at all. And so what that's led a lot of people to do, this is that, that increased standard deduction was part of President Trump's tax act a couple years ago. So a lot of people start saying, I still wanna do my charitable giving, but I'm not gonna get any benefit. So people started combining their charitable giving two or three years worth at one time. Say, look, I'm gonna give, $10,000 to this charitable organization every year. So if I do that every year, I get no benefit from my charitable giving. I'm not getting over that 25,100 hurdle. But if I do two years worth, $20,000 this year, zero next year, 20,000 a year after that, I'll get some benefit from it. So that's this charitable bunching strategy that we've talked with a lot of clients about, still applies under the current tax code. Um, What's new for 2021, kind of unique for 2021, part of COVID, there is an, uh, a deduction, $600 of cash uh, given to charity that you get to, to deduct on your tax return, whether you itemize your deductions or not. So this is kind of another one of those things that regardless of what people do, 
whether you're going to itemize or not, at least give $600 if, if you're planning to give to charity in cash this year. You'll get a small benefit for that. Um, also unique for 2021, uh, all of your charitable giving is limited uh, to a percentage of your gross income for the year. Generally speaking, the IRS says you can't offset your full liability with charitable giving. Uh, it's generally limited to 50% of your gross income. If I have $100,000 of, of income on my tax return, I'm only going to be able to take a $50,000 charitable deduction, even if I give more than that to charity in the current year. If you give more than that to charity, that additional, that excess will carry over for five years. You don't lose it, but it's going to go on your tax return uh, in future years. So um, what they did, again, for uh, kind of COVID relief is said one year only will give you a hundred percent deduction if you give cash donations. So for somebody that wants to and look at their tax return and say, I want to take a zero liability, I could, uh, if I have a hundred thousand dollars of income, I could take a hundred thousand dollars and give it to charity, but it has to be cash. And I could write off the whole thing this year. I think there are some really good reasons not to do that. So before you do that, <laughs> talk to me. Um, but there are just to let you know, there's some Kind of unique one-time benefits. If you were considering, uh, I want to give a lot to charity this year for one reason or another, there are various vehicles to use, and this year has that unique feature in it that we could explore. Um, one of the ways under here you see there's uh, donating appreciated stock. So a lot of you, you may know this, but I'm continued to be surprised that folks um, who've been investing a long time uh, haven't been using appreciated stock for their donations. Um, a really, really efficient tax planning tool that's out there. So the idea is I'm going to give $10,000 to this charity, but instead of giving cash, let me find an investment that I have that has appreciated in value that I've held more than one year. And that um, stock holding that I have, I'm going to take $10,000 worth of those shares and I'm going to donate that to charity. Charity gets $10,000 worth of stock. They can sell that stock tax-free because they're a tax exempt organization, you get to deduct $10,000 for the gift. But what you've avoided is the full tax bill on the gain on that. If you bought that for $6,000, then you're de deducting $10,000 on something that you paid $6,000. So even if you don't itemize your deductions, donating stock is still a tax efficient way to give. If you say, I'm going to give less than that, that 25,100 hurdle, I'm not going to get over it, um, but I still want to give to charity. Uh, still look at your, your investment holdings. It's also a really good solution for, I've got this stock that has a tax bill attached to it. I don't know what to do with it because I don't want to pay that tax bill. Um, charitable giving is a great thing to do with, with those holdings. Um, they do have a 30% AGI limitation. So again, that idea that you can't offset your full tax liability with a, with a donation. If you're using a stock rather than uh, cash, it goes down to 30%. Uh, so we have to be a little bit smart with how much, what's the maximum amount we can give. Donor advised fund as well is a tool that can be used um, for charitable giving. Donor advised fund is a really becoming very popular in large part because a lot of people are looking at bunching and a lot of people are looking at donating appreciated stock because the market's done so well. The donor advised fund is a way for you to set up a fund with uh, a, a essentially a, a brokerage account, a custodian, and you can donate into that fund. Um, you get the tax deduction in the year you make the donation, but then those funds can sit there in that donor advised fund and you can release it, direct the, the organization when you want to re release those funds out to charity and what charity they want to go to. So you might say, I want to do a charitable, a large charitable gift this year, but I want the organization to still get the same amount every year. Or maybe I want to give to charity, but I don't yet know exactly where I want to, where and when I want that money to be distributed to charity. The donor advised fund allows you to move it in there. It's earmarked for charity. You can't ever get it out, but it can sit in there until you decide how you want it. Right? Um, Yeah, absolutely. Yep. 
You do. So yeah, in that scenario, the donor buys one can accept cash and it can just, you can hold cash in there and release it whenever you want. It can also accept appreciated stock. So the kind of great strategy, pretty common strategy is to say, I wanna look at two, three, four years worth of giving. If I have appreciated stock, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna move that appreciated stock into my donor advice fund, take the deduction in the year that I move it in there. And then over the next four years, I will tell that fund, I want you to send this much to this charity, this charity, this charity. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's, yep, you're right. Yes, yeah, thank you uh, for mentioning that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so you can, <laughs> yeah, the donor advised fund, when you put it in there, you can control investments as well. So especially if you're thinking, this is a one-time thing that I'd like to, to give out of for 10 or 20 years and you're comfortable with the idea that that account could go up and down in value, you can invest it and potentially get significant growth on those assets so that ultimately when you give the charity, you're given even more than what you originally put in the account. Yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yep. Correct. No. Yeah. Correct, yeah. You do have to be sure uh, you're getting rid of that. All right, so uh, last one here. Oh, I'm already at time. I'm sorry. So this is the last one, qualified charitable distribution, IRAs. Uh, once you get over 70 and a half, up to $100,000 a person. Um, the nice thing about qualified charitable distributions, this fulfills your required minimum distribution for the year. And it also doesn't get added into your tax return. So this is a great vehicle for someone, really, if, if you don't need your required distribution from your IRA for living expenses, you're just taking it out because the government says you have to, and you're giving to charity as well in the year, you probably should be using your IRA to do that. Um, you get this benefit even if you're not claiming itemized deductions. If you're claiming standard deduction, you still get a benefit because that income doesn't show up on your tax return. So there are uh, kind of pros and cons to using the IRA versus using appreciated stock. And we can look at those for you, but this is a tool that's very powerful, um, probably still a little underutilized by a lot of folks. Um, we can help kind of talk through those things. All right, well, um, we're at time. I, uh, I'm gonna skip over the gift thing. I'm real quick, if you guys are up for it, I'll talk about tax reform, because I feel like this is what people probably wanna, wanna hear from me on. And um, I can be very brief with it because we really don't know anything yet. So, um, yeah. A lot of headlines. Uh, a lot of talk about it. Um, Congress has passed an infrastructure bill last week that the president expects to sign. That infrastructure bill is not the massive tax bill that everyone was talking about. Very few things in the infrastructure bill that have to do with taxes. Uh, you can see their employee retention credit, that's for employers, goes away. Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, and um, uh, Ethereum and the, the like, now the IRS says more reporting has to be done by brokers. That's really it in the infrastructure. Yeah. But Congress has said next week when they come back, they're gonna talk through this Build Back Better, the budget reconciliation bill that has all these tax provisions in it. So we probably will know more in the next couple of weeks. President Biden um, produced a document back in September or October that had kind of the proposals for it. And it was massive and it was really pretty bad. Uh, if you were over certain income levels, it was a whole lot of changes. Um, just, uh, last week or two weeks ago, they released kind of a revised trim back version and it, it is much more palatable um, in its current discussion form. We'll see what happens as they come back to Congress. But right now, these are kind of the, the things that are still being talked about that are in there. Um, if your income is over $10 million, there's an additional 5% tax uh, rate. If your income is over 25 million, the additional 3% over top of that. So they're not actually, yeah, so if you have that problem, congratulations. I, I do not. Um, yeah, so they're not talking about currently about changing the tax brackets for everyone else. This is just an additional tax for, you know, the, the ultra um, high income. 
That next one um, has been talked about. They're, they're looking at limitations on really large IRAs uh, to where if your IRA is over $10 million, they're not gonna let you keep contributing into it. Um, and they're gonna make you take distributions out of it even, even before age 72, just saying you can't have that much in there. So that typically happens when a business owner starts a business, puts their business stock in that IRA and the business blows up. It's hard to get to that level just by putting in you know, the, the amounts that you're allowed every year, although you, you can. But um, then there's a 3.8% um, surtax that has been applied to investment income in the past. They're talking about expanding that potentially to business income if you work in a business in a partnership or an S corporation. Um, corporate tax increases, and then those wash sale rules that we talked about didn't used to apply to, to Bitcoin and the like. Now they're going to start applying to cryptocurrency. That's what, that's really kind of the main things that they're still talking about here. Um, there's also some good things in there as far as expanding or extending child, uh, uh, tax credits. Um, they are even considering raising, we talked about that $10,000 limit on itemized deductions um, for state and local taxes. They're talking about raising that maybe to $80,000 so people could get a large deduction back. So. Yeah, and that one, you know, maybe a little counterintuitive. Why would they be doing this? But you have to remember that provision was really unpopular um, in some of the more traditionally democratic states, New England, that have really high state taxes. Um, you know, those uh, kind of democratic administrations over the years have raised high taxes, and then all of a sudden the federal government says, you can't deduct those anymore. So now that there's a democratic administration, they might be to a certain degree saying, we're gonna allow that back. So you high tax states, the Californias and New Yorks, um, your constituents will be happy about having this deduction back. Um, they were originally talking about doing away or limiting Roth conversions and what are known as backdoor Roth contributions. That is, has been left out in the newest version. So our hope is that those will stay fully in place. Um, ordinary tax rates, capital gains rates, they were talking about increasing those, some of them substantially. Um, for folks over a certain income levels, those have been left out of the new proposal. Um, the estate tax rules, they were talking about doing away with cost basis step up at death, lowering the lifetime exemption down significantly. Those have all been left out as well. Those were some massive pieces to that original version that everyone heard and, you know, kind of freaked out about myself included. <laughs> and um, those have all, all been left out. So we'll see what happens. But that, that kind of massive overhaul has been trimmed down significantly uh, in hopes of trying to make it more palatable to pass through Congress. And so um, more to come on that. This, there's a, a tax foundation. It's kind of a, a nonprofit website that anybody can go on to. We sometimes look at for a good, um, pretty easy to digest, succinct uh, summaries of legislation like this. Don't go out and try and read the law uh, itself. It's, it's terrible. Um, and if something does get passed, we will do our best to kind of proactively put together communications for you guys and, and let you know, here's what we think might be changing that's going to impact you. All right, that's it. I'm already five minutes over, and um, I am happy to stay uh, if you guys have questions, um, but I don't want to keep anybody. Yes. Yeah, so if you've got a dedicated tax advisor here and you know who that is, you can reach out to them directly. Um, we're reaching out to clients, but we're happy to have clients come to us. If you don't have a dedicated tax advisor, you are also welcome to reach out to your uh, wealth advisor and just let them know, I want to have a, a projection done. Uh, 
Yeah, anything else? Uh, I know I was talking fast, that was a lot. Uh, income reduction strategies, tax reform. Um, I'll stick around up front, Jason will be yeah, up I'll front stick as, well. as well. So yeah. feel free to come up uh, and we can, we can. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, I hope it was yes, it was you. helpful, but even uh, beyond the information, I just really like seeing everybody um, and would love to talk with you for a bit afterwards if you're up for it. So, thanks, guys. Yeah, we can, I forgot to mention that.